Tom today commented about uh, freedom of speech laws in Australia and how they're fucked up. Uh, this person's from New York City. A lot of people in the US don't really understand laws in Australia, and I didn't really understand much freedom of speech laws until recently, and uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, more comments about the Eugene McGee case, which is another South Australian case that caused a lot of controversy. We were in the Supreme Court, and basically I was told, we were told, if you take down YouTube videos, you won't go to prison. If you don't take down YouTube videos, then you are liable to be held in contempt of court and face imprisonment. So you can go to prison for putting up a YouTube video showing your honest opinion. But if you're a lawyer and you kill a cyclist and you got a lot of buddies in the law system, <laughs> then <laughs> we'll give you a little fine and it'll be all right. And it'll be a Royal Commission, but we won't find you guilty of nothing. So here's a good, great documentary. It was on Australian TV. Uh, this was very divided, divided the state a lot, this, this, uh, this situation where the, the legal guy, the lawyer, uh, had all his buddies giving him advice, tweaking the system, don't go to the cops to get alcohol tested because, you know, it might, you know, fuck it up. You get lesser charge if you just evade police versus actually go to the police yourself. Just all these little things that, unless you're in the legal system, protected in that little cotton wool of the legal industry of your buddies and egos, you don't really know about. So when you're going to go up against the system, you've got to be prepared to lose. I'm prepared to do that, uh, just not right now when you're going to Thailand. Check out this documentary, Australian Story, Eugene McGree case, Road to Nowhere, and leave your comments down below. Check it out, it's actually a good watch. And just look at the alcoholic fucking lawyer cunts who supported this death of this cyclist and the psychiatrist and all these fucking quacks. Just really disgusting scumbag society. Check it out. Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Welcome to a new season of Australian Story. Tonight's program is about a woman taking on some of the most powerful institutions in her home state and changing the way things are done. She's helped to instigate two criminal trials, a royal commission and a legal conduct hearing, earning praise for her courage and resilience. But Di Gilchrist says she still hasn't achieved the one thing she most wants. She's telling her story tonight for the first time. What? You're angry? <laughs> Taking out your anger on your biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> the 30th of November 2003 is a day I remember well. The house was full of kids craft projects that I needed to get completed and return to school. But on top of that, I thought, let's make some shortbreads for the girls' classmates at school as Christmas presents. Do you have enough of these, Darcy? So I think we need a lot in each bag. Dad came in and said he was going to go for a ride. It was sort of just the general thing, you know, I was used to it, didn't really acknowledge it too much, you know. So he came in, kissed me on the head and, you know, said, see a coach, and then walked out. How long do these go for? So these will take about 10 minutes to cook per tray. So that was about four o'clock. And he said, I'm going to head out Freeling Way. And I said, fine. I said, you know, ride safely, love you. That was the last thing I said to him. How many degrees is the oven at now? 180, how many minutes set? About half past six, I started to think he's been gone for a really, really long time. Maybe he's had a breakdown. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to look Christmassy. Christmassy. Christmas and I tried to call him about four or five times, but the phone wasn't on. It was just going straight to voicemail. Mum, there's only three left. And then Mum finally decided. She said, "Oh, I'm going to go out looking for him." So me and Zoe stayed here. Yeah, I remember it pretty good. It was a beautiful day, so we thought we'd make the most of it and go for a bit of a country drive. This is the road we're travelling down after uh, visiting our friends. We're just coming up to the Freeling intersection now, where we stopped for traffic, and uh, it's where Tony saw the vehicle. 
Basically, what I seen was a uh, four-wheel drive. I think it was a dark, bluish colour. Yeah, driving a hell of a speed. Basically, it was driving all over the road, crossing the white lines, one side to the other, driving like a friggin' idiot. And I said to John, I said, uh, yeah, check it out, check it out, that friggin' idiot. I continued down the Freeling Road for a while. I saw a police car. I tried not to think too much about it. I thought it's not that unusual. And as I got further down the road, I could see the road was blocked off. And as I got out, I said to myself, please don't let this be because of Ian. And we continued up the road, and it looked like um, there was a ute. I think it had a trailer on the back. It was parked in the middle of the road, and there was a lot of debris. And uh, this little Italian guy came up. We've, we've pulled up here, and this is where we're getting waved at. Um, he didn't stop. He didn't stop. He killed him. He didn't stop. Him, him, and I'm like, what, who, you know, who, what? And he's going, him, he's dead, he didn't stop. And I looked behind and could see the guy, and, and I was like, oh shit, it was my pretty well exact words. Oh, I, I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll chase this dude, I'll get him, you know? And um, I thought, uh, I'll be able to catch him, no worries. But uh, John said, oh, I need you here, I need you here. It was one of the biggest regrets I ever had because, like, uh, had I uh, caught and caught him, the guy could have been brought to justice straight away, you know, for what I believe he'd done wrong. Basically, I, I clearly believe he was under the influence of something, uh, the way he was driving. And I walked over to... There were two police officers standing there. And... Um, <laughs> And I said to them, please don't tell me that the road's blocked because there's been an accident involving a cyclist. And the police officer looked at me and he said, why do you ask? And I said, because my husband went out for a ride and he hasn't come home. I just said, you'd better come with us. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? And he said, there was an accident involving a cyclist. I asked the police officer about the ambulance and he just said to me, one was called, but it wasn't required. I didn't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what had happened. Um, and I, I asked a few questions. I asked where the car was, like what had happened. And he just said to me it, it had been a single car he run. The road was closed for nearly five hours as major crash investigators examined the scene. I was a reporter for Channel 7 in Adelaide and within minutes I'd had a phone call from a contact, an officer who'd said, there's a bit more to this, it's a high profile person, I can't say too much yet but if I were you I'd start heading out there. So the cameraman and I started driving out there, making the drive which was about an hour away. I um, thought of a young kid, a young boy, an 18 year old boy for some reason. I had this image of a young kid who had hit Ian and panicked and I sat there and, and I thought there's probably this poor young kid at home with his family who is so distraught. After being there for a little while my contact phoned again and said how's it all going and I was talking to him and he said look the person we're looking for is, have you, have you realised who it is yet? And I said, no. And he said, it's Eugene McGee, the prominent defence lawyer, and obviously I was aware who Eugene was. 49-year-old Eugene McGee is one of the state's most respected defence lawyers, a former police officer and prosecutor. 
There were two people travelling to Adelaide in a vehicle ahead of Mr McGee's and uh, the driver saw the actual impact in his rearview mirror and his wife uh, noted the registration number of Mr McGee's vehicle and uh, telephone police. And he said his mother lives not far from here. She lives only a few blocks away or a few kilometres away. So I asked what the address was and we drove out there. And when we got to the house, I remember seeing sort of up the driveway a Pajero that had the dent in the bonnet. And the camera and I were, were shocked. The whole situation seemed totally bizarre that a, there, there were no police at the house. I couldn't believe that a car, the car that was wanted from this hit and run, was sitting in the driveway and so obviously involved. Two hours after the badly damaged car was located by Seven News. And then my phone started ringing. Obviously, I'd said to the girls, I will only be a short while, but they obviously were worried. Um, they'd been very aware of how long I'd been gone and they were ringing and I, I just couldn't answer the phone. I just knew that I couldn't speak to them over the phone. I couldn't tell them that everything was okay. I couldn't hide the fact that I was very distressed. Um, so I didn't, I didn't answer the phone. I um, instead rang, well, the police rang a friend. He said, uh, there's no doubt that the cyclist is deceased. There's no question about that. Uh, uh, it would be helpful if uh, we could have some support here for Di. We came home and I sat down with him on the couch. And I... I didn't know what to say, and I just said, you know, I'm really sorry, but Daddy was hit when he was riding his bike. And unfortunately, Daddy died. And they were just heartbroken. <laughs> they were 10 and 8 at the time. You know, she said, Daddy's gone. And I remember Zoe so goes, what's happened? And Mum goes, Daddy's been you know, in an accident, he's not coming back. And Zoe goes to a hospital, was in, and it was really hard because I'd grasped it, but Zoe hadn't. That, you know, we, we were never gonna see our dad again. And Chloe, who was eight, asked me who had done this, who hit her daddy. And I said, I don't know, because they didn't stop. And she just screamed. It is the fact that after the impact, the vehicle that had struck Ian Humphrey continued on in the direction of Adelaide, but we now know that some short distance down the road it turned off on a side road. Eugene McGee had made, I think, somewhere between 15 and 20 telephone calls between the time of the impact and when he was finally presented to police. He'd called a number of people, um, his wife, his uh, uh, brother, um, his uh, uh, solicitor, uh, and there'd been repeat calls to uh, some or all of those people. Who did he not call? Well, he didn't call the police. I was surprised when we first learned that the driver was a lawyer and someone of maturity someone who has education and opportunity and some standing in the community, as one uh, thought perhaps a lawyer might have, um, would have behaved differently. Eventually, Craig, his brother, drove Eugene McGee in Craig's vehicle, I think, to Adelaide. They drove past the accident scene. Uh, police were, of course, present investigating and uh, uh, they drove through without volunteering Eugene McGee's presence and involvement in the collision. Once back in Adelaide, arrangements had been made with police to attend at uh, the home of Eugene McGee's lawyer. 
By the time the police apprehended Eugene McGee, um, six hours had passed between the, uh, the time of the um, accident and uh, his apprehension. We were trying to locate Mr McGee. Um, whether we could have done more, I'm not so sure. Um, the reality was that Mr McGee decided to take evasive action and put himself out of the reach of police on that particular evening. I assumed that when the driver of the car was located that they would be um, tested for alcohol, whether that be by breath or blood analysis, and that they would be arrested and charged with killing somebody. Sergeant Hassel, who I think was the arresting officer, um, in the course of conveying uh, Mr McGee to the watch house, said that he observed the smell of alcohol on uh, Mr McGee's breath. He was, of course, well outside the two-hour period for a breath analysis, which is legislated for. The police um, didn't do any blood alcohol test. Um, there was a procedure available to them, which they might have uh, um, used to require Mr McGee to give them a blood sample, but it didn't happen. A couple of nights later, a member of the police force came around, a police officer, and uh, interviewed us separately, took statements, went through exactly what had occurred, where we were, what had been seen. I clearly remember saying that I'd seen the guy driving like a friggin' idiot, driving all over the road. Yeah, the police officer said to me, it sounds like uh, crucial evidence. And he, he did say that uh, you will probably have to be uh, give it evidence in court and uh, will, will you be available to do that? It seemed like a blatant cut and dry case. What stinks about this overall is there's a wife without a husband, a child without a father, a brother without a brother. I really couldn't think that. I, I couldn't absorb what had happened. I couldn't absorb that I was now going to be alone with the girls. My first job was a correctional officer at Adelaide Jail. And in that very romantic old setting, happened to see Ian just standing very relaxed in one of the yards. So Ian was a correctional officer and there was an instant thing. I thought to myself, I'm going to marry that man. And it was really quite bizarre. <laughs> He was like a big kid as a husband. It was the best thing. When I met Ian, he was never going to have children. And having children was more or less the best thing that ever happened to him because he got to explore that child within. I remember that he was really into cycling. I remember that he used to spend a lot of time up in the shed working on his bikes and he'd always be mucking around with something. Ian was working as a rehabilitation officer for South Australia Police. Ian would work very hard to develop a relationship with his clients. He'd always include a chocolate frog in the mail out just to give them something to laugh at or have a giggle or think he was an idiot. <laughs> but it, it became something he was renowned for. He used to buy about 10 packets of chocolate frogs every fortnight, I think. Ian's coffin ended up being covered in chocolate frogs. He must have had 400 chocolate frogs on his coffin because all the people who he worked with and who he'd been involved with bought a chocolate frog for him and placed it on top of his coffin. I don't think there has been day since that crash when Eugene McGee hasn't been overwhelmed by remorse. On the Tuesday following the accident, a legal uh, colleague on my behalf uh, 
On the front page of the advertiser extended to the family my sympathies and my apologies for what happened. And uh, during 2004, on uh, two occasions, I, uh, through uh, Mr Humphrey's brother Neil, who was a solicitor, through his employer, I offered, made an offer to meet any of the family who were prepared to meet me to convey to them personally my sympathies and apologies, and I understood that uh, and completely respected the fact they didn't want to meet with me. I've bumped into him in the streets of Adelaide. He's never once shown any remorse, any contrition, and he certainly never, ever said that he's sorry to me. Mr McGee is charged with causing death by dangerous driving, failing to stop after a fatal accident and failing to render assistance. On the 19th of December, we went to court for the first time, and that was the first time I encountered McGee. The court heard Mr McGee is such a well-known local barrister, the DPP can't find anyone to prosecute him. So there was lots of courtroom wrangling around whether the case should ever come to any sort of trial. We were concerned that many of the lawyers had been to the same law school. They were people that worked very closely together. I think it's a small law community in Adelaide. Well, it's inevitable that in a small legal community such as Adelaide's, uh, Eugene McGee is going to be known by uh, a, a number of practising lawyers. He's obviously going to be known by people he might have gone to law school with. But how that could legitimately give rise to any concern, um, I, I find difficult to fathom. McGee's lawyers will argue on Friday their client has no case to answer. How far is it again? It's about 500 k's, honey. OK. The girls and I went to Mount Gambia to be with my family, and it's a five-hour drive. So I think that was more or less the first time I'd had any time to just think as I was driving. And I guess the penny dropped, so to speak, that the person who had killed Ian was somebody who was knowledgeable and educated, and not only in a general sense, but in a legal sense. Somebody who was connected. Somebody who obviously knew how to protect themselves. I don't care something. And I thought, I need to smarten up. I just compiled a list of questions in my head, and I thought, I need to start asking some questions. I just couldn't get over the feeling that the police weren't doing all they could to investigate the crash. This was most apparent when I asked the officer in charge, Dan Hassel, whether they'd found out what McGee had been doing earlier that day. And then he said no. And I said, well, that's a bit of a concern. Have you checked his phone and credit card records? As I imagined would be a fairly... It's what they did on all the TV shows. I guess it was fairly standard policing. And he said, no, we haven't. The general consensus or feeling was that he had been at Kapunda. I thought, I'll go to Kapunda. And I'd actually been asking lots of questions and a friend had told me he'd heard a rumour he'd been at a certain hotel. I just had this burning desire to know, not only to know, but to try and understand what it was that happened that night, how it happened and why it happened. I went to the first hotel and the minute I mentioned Eugene McGee's name, it was like a door had been slammed in my face. So I more or less came back from there, none the wiser. And the girls are doing well, and that's the main thing? She was quite clearly frustrated by what was happening. She was looking for answers to questions, and sometimes the answers didn't come. Uh, she'll graduate in a couple of months. My name's Michael O'Connell. I'm the Commissioner for Victims' Rights. The first time I met Di was over a cup of coffee, but she turned to me and she said, if you're just another bureaucrat and you're here to silence me, then you might as well pack your bag and go home now. Thanks for coming in today. Oh, thanks I'd for meeting with me. I understand you're still having some problems. With this was a lady who was not a lawyer. 
She was seeking answers to questions about a very strange world, a world that she didn't choose to become part of. You met with the senior police officer? How did that go? I just feel like I'm being patronised, Michael. Nobody wants to give me any answers. Well, do you think it would help if you gave me the questions that you want answered and, and I write on your behalf? And... It appeared to her that the people that she had asked to help her were the people who were putting obstacles in her way. The people that she expected to help her were the people who appeared to have most let her down. Dyer had been told there had been no blood test, there had been no alcohol test, and the office of the DPP at the time just essentially said, go home, bake cakes, get on with your life, and uh, we'll deal with this. But it's very unlikely to ever come to trial. When I talked about that with my husband at home, we, uh, we thought they'd said that to the wrong woman, really. I had a meeting with the Director of Public Prosecutions, Paul Rofe, and he sat me down and told me that mine was just one case and there were many others. I said, well, that's actually not my problem. I want you to investigate and prosecute this case as it should be. And he got very, very angry with me. He said to me, this case is not going to go to trial. This is going to be dealt with as a summary matter in the magistrate's court. And I turned around and I said to him, over my dead body, that will happen. Someone has been killed. That can't happen. And he said to me, he was very flustered by this time. He said, we could have got it to trial if the coppers hadn't stuffed things up. And he realised he'd dropped the bomb that he shouldn't have. And he said, oh, uh, if they would have taken blood. And I said, let's just stop. What do you mean? They've been telling me for all these months they couldn't take blood. And he said, oh, they could have used the Forensic Procedures Act to take blood. They didn't do that. They stuffed it up. And he said, it's as simple as that. It'll be a summary matter. And I was just devastated. Oh, in my view, it would have been an excellent thing if uh, police had taken a blood test because it could have removed um, all of this speculation about alcohol having anything to do with this, um, this terrible accident. I said to Rolf, there was only one reason that McGee didn't stop, and that was because he'd been drinking and Rolf turned around and said to me, that was the first thing I thought, the only reason Eugene didn't stop was because he was pissed. And I realised that my fight was not just about Ian, it was about the big picture, it was about the system. So this was the system and it was overwhelming and daunting to think that at every level it had failed. I found out the trial had taken place and that we weren't called, and I couldn't understand why we weren't uh, brought forward to uh, say a bit. As Attorney General, I want to apologise to Di Kilchrist and the Humphreys family for the outcome of our justice system in the case of Eugene McGee. The problem. Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Tonight, the conclusion of our story about a woman taking on powerful institutions and changing the way things are done. Her name is Di Gilchrist. Eight years ago, her husband, Ian Humphrey, went out for a bike ride and never returned. He was struck by a four-wheel drive vehicle driven by prominent lawyer, Eugene McGee. Mr. McGee failed to stop. He admitted he'd been drinking, but police never tested him for blood alcohol. His eventual penalty was a fine and suspension of his license. 
The case has galvanised public opinion in South Australia. We start with this recap. Dad came in and said he was going to go for a ride. And I said, you know, ride safely, love you. That was the last thing I said to him. Basically, what I seen was a uh, full drive driving at a hell of a speed. Crossing the white lines, one side to the other, driving like a friggin' idiot. And he just said it, it had been a single car hit run. Within minutes, I'd had a phone call from an officer who'd said, there's a bit more to this, it's a high-profile person. Mr McGee decided to take evasive action. By the time the police apprehended Eugene McGee, um, six hours had passed. The police didn't do any blood alcohol test. The court heard Mr McGee is such a well-known local barrister, the DPP can't find anyone to prosecute him. I had a meeting with the Director of Public Prosecutions, Paul Rofe. He said we could have got it to trial if the coppers hadn't stuffed things up. I was a sole parent, which was something I was getting my head around. And it was the night times that were the empty times for me. That was when the, the hollowness and I guess the torture would start. My laptop became my confidant and best friend. Email became my weapon of choice. I would email anybody who I thought should be aware of what was going on. Di was one of the most prolific writers that I have ever had to deal with. In fact, there were two, three hundred, maybe more emails. I'm sure that there are many people who found her challenging. Unlike uh, many victims, Di wasn't prepared to be relegated to being just a passive person, a person sitting on the sidelines. It was like we got to the top of the mountain when we actually got it to go to trial. Eugene McGee was charged with causing death by dangerous driving and failing to stop and render assistance and he pled not guilty to the cause death by dangerous driving, but he did plead guilty to the failing to stop and render assistance. The Crown Prosecutor, Theresa Anderson, said McGee knew exactly what he was doing on that fateful day near Freeling in November 2003. One of the things that was really concerning us during that trial was that the jury didn't know that Eugene McGee had particular expertise in traffic offences. But the court also heard McGee had been fined for speeding six times since 1997. It very much felt like I was alone and Eugene McGee had a revolving door of barristers at his disposal. Every time we appear in court, it's yet another well-known Queen's counsel representing him. So it's pretty much the David and Goliath scenario. McGee's attorney, Grant Algie, says there was no evidence presented during the trial to prove his client was either speeding or under the influence of alcohol at the time of the crash. The thing for the trial for me was that it would actually be the open book, so to speak, that we could actually discover what had happened on that night. But what we were to learn was really quite disturbing. My account of what occurred on the night of the crash uh, is uh, covered in the court transcript. Uh, my understanding is that Mr Algie, who was my barrister at that trial and conducted the trial, is going to speak to you in relation to the trial and, and the conduct, and I don't wish to make any further statement in relation to that. It was what might be fairly regarded as an unremarkable Sunday, where uh, he'd left uh, Adelaide, uh, driven up to Kapunda, which is uh, in the Barossa, um, to join his brother to take his mother out for Sunday lunch. An unremarkable beginning 
to a quite extraordinary, tragic day. There was subsequently evidence obtained via his uh, credit card statement, which indicated that there'd been three bottles of wine and uh, one um, stubby of beer uh, purchased during the course of the afternoon. Eugene took his mother home, had a cup of tea, and then headed home. I think Eugene's evidence was he was travelling at about 100 kilometres an hour from memory. He was approaching a car that was in front of him uh, with a view to passing it. He pulled out to look to see if it was safe to pass. Another car was oncoming, so he moved back in. Obviously, the car in front had moved out a little bit to pass Mr Humphreys, a cyclist. And in a split second, uh, the tragic accident happened. He had this horrid vision of Mr Humphreys hitting the windscreen of the car. As far as uh, anyone can tell, uh, it's probable that Ian died immediately upon impact. He described from my memory that after he'd seen that, he just kept going, he just couldn't stop. He actually said during his evidence that one of the first thoughts that came into his mind was for his career. He worried about being arrested and the impact on his career. That was the part that made us so disgusted and angry. You think, well, why? Why didn't they stop? Why couldn't they have helped, you know? Why is my dad dead and the guy who killed him not dead? How is that fair for anybody? Why did he not stop? I wonder how many times he's asked himself that. How can you not regret the fact that you're involved, even innocently involved, in an event that led to the death of another human being? How can you not regret that? And of course, of course, he looks at himself and wishes that he'd stopped. But you can't turn back time. After the impact, it appears that Mr McGee drove via a side road back to Kapunda. He waited some time at a quarry near Kapunda, eventually returning to his mother's home where he met up with his brother. Eventually, uh, Craig, his brother, uh, drove uh, Eugene McGee uh, in Craig's vehicle, I think, uh, to Adelaide, where he was then able to meet up with his uh, uh, legal advisors. We have a period of almost six hours that Eugene McGee had been absent from the police's presence. There is no doubt in my mind that Eugene McGee's actions were very orchestrated and they were planned to the last minute on that night. I believe they were acting with the intent of evading police for as long as possible and reducing any chance there was of Eugene McGee being um, tested for alcohol. The likelihood was that at the time of driving, which was at about, I think the accident was at about 10 past five, uh, the likelihood is his blood alcohol level was zero. Eugene McGee's knowledge of the law put him in a privileged position. He knew that the penalty for avoiding police was far less than it would be if he was confronted or, or handed himself over to the police and was found to have a positive blood alcohol reading. 
Pip wasn't trying to evade the police. Was he following a strategy as advised by his lawyer? He wasn't trying to evade the police or follow any strategy. Once he got into Adelaide and spoke to his lawyer, his lawyer contacted the police. Professor McFarlane said McGee told him of traumatic incidents in his past career as a police officer, where he had to deal with disfigured bodies. It was in the last days of the trial that the defence produced a psychiatrist's report suggesting that McGee failed to stop and render assistance because he was suffering a dissociative state. It suggested he'd had a traumatic life as a police officer. And uh, most recently, he was the solicitor for one of the Snowtown murderers, which uh, I think it's fair to say was one of the most grotesque cases of, uh, of depraved humanity that you're likely to come upon. Eight bodies were found in six barrels in a disused bank vault in Snowtown, north of Adelaide. The combined effect of those exposures over the years essentially gave rise to a post-traumatic stress disorder or a dissociative type state when this accident occurred such that he couldn't essentially bring himself to stop. I guess it seemed very, very convenient. To my knowledge, he had not been diagnosed or treated for post-traumatic stress prior to him killing in. Well, it was described by some, and it's a term I think I agree with, it's, it's a bit of an ambush. Once we knew where the psychiatric evidence was going for the defence, we should have obtained, uh, or been prompt in obtaining a, a, a second opinion. Uh, and um, my, my recollection is that um, we struggled to do that. So uh, the end result was that uh, the defence evidence on that point went unchallenged. Good evening. First tonight, hit-run lawyer Eugene McGee has left court a free man after escaping a jail term for killing a cyclist. Instead, he's been fined and banned from driving, a sentence that's been met with outrage, shock and disbelief. The verdict was not guilty of death by dangerous driving. He was found guilty of driving without due care. There was this absolute sense of disbelief, of anger, of despair that this could happen, that someone responsible for killing a man, leaving him by the side of the road, failing to render assistance, just got off with a fine. As Attorney General, I want to apologise to Di Kilchrist and the Humphreys family for the outcome of our justice system in the case of Eugene McGee. In my view, the verdict was entirely proper and I must say it was hardly a surprising verdict to anybody who was actually involved in the trial and heard the evidence. The two brothers who witnessed Eugene McGee's driving before the collision happened uh, were not called as witnesses. Basically what I seen was a uh, full drive, I think it was a dark bluish colour, yeah, driving a hell of a speed. Basically he was driving all over the road. On Eugene McGee's final day... I remember watching the news report. The reason that a harsh conviction hadn't gone forward was there was lacking witnesses and lacking evidence. Mr Algy said it wasn't dangerous driving. There was, he said, no speed, no erratic or bizarre behaviour. Nor... Which I found astounding since we were told that our evidence was crucial and um, no doubt would be summoned to court and to testify. Uh, I found out the trial had taken place and that we weren't called, and I couldn't understand why we weren't uh, brought forward to uh, say a bit. If the Zizima brothers gave evidence to the trial, there could well have been a very different outcome. Uh, the reason they weren't called at trial is because in the statements that they'd given to the police, they had nothing of any relevance to add to the causation of this accident. Is there anything you'd like to say to the family of your victim? Yes, there was pressure on the government to do something, 
um, from the public and especially through uh, the uh, independent MP Nick Xenophon who was representing uh, Di Gilchrist. The government decided to hold a royal commission to examine how the case was investigated, how it was prosecuted, but also to address the accusation that the prosecution was ambushed. Commissioner Greg James wanted to see for himself where McGee ran down cyclist Ian Humphrey. The Royal Commissioner found that uh, the police investigation had been inappropriately conducted in a number of ways. One of the consequences was an apparent lack of urgency in uh, uh, arresting Mr McGee. I have a very strong view in relation to whether police should have located him earlier and there is many people suggested we should have. It was Mr McGee who actually put himself outside of the reach of police. It wasn't the police doing and I think that point is very, very important to make. He took action himself to put himself outside of the reach of police. Mr Zizamu said when interviewed by Sergeant Edward Hassel, he told him McGee was driving like an effing idiot. The Commissioner thought that none of the investigating officers had properly understood the potential importance of the Zizamu brothers' evidence. They were told they'd be key witnesses, but they were never called to testify. Sergeant Hassel was criticised for not having made proper notes of his conversations with the Zizamu brothers. That was the reasons why they weren't called at trial, because the DPP's office weren't uh, properly informed of what they might have been able to say. I think uh, with the wisdom of hindsight, we do acknowledge now that uh, if we had our time again, we would do things differently uh, from a number of aspects. I was approached by the Royal Commission to review the psychiatric evidence that had been given at the original trial that Mr McGee, in all probability, had suffered a post-trauma disorder following his involvement with the Snowtown massacres. It was my view that no such defence existed. One other very senior professor of psychiatry was also involved in reviewing the evidence and we both had come to the same conclusion that this evidence was really not credible. I'd never been more personally outraged about what I personally see as being a, in the common lingo, a mistrial, a travesty of the justice system. The Commissioner found that the prosecution should have called expert psychiatric evidence to offer an alternative view to that expressed by Professor McFarlane. But uh, at the trial, uh, one opinion was all the jury got. Psychiatric evidence was presented late in the piece in the trial. The prosecution chooses not to seek a, an adjournment for other evidence. I, I think it was a um, total botch up. I think it would have been extremely helpful if there'd been a f second psychiatric report obtained for the first trial because in forensic matters, I think expert opinion always needs to be very carefully tested. What was presented in court was in fact a sanitised truth. It was a truth that left the jury with no alternative but to find him not guilty of the most serious offence that he had been charged. two reports produced from the Royal Commission and one of them remains secret to this day. Quite bizarre. Well, because it is a, a, a closed report, uh, I, I'm reluctant to, uh, to comment on its uh, contents. It, it was referred to the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions. That secret report was the one which led to 
the new charges being placed against Eugene and Craig McGee for conspiring to pervert the course of justice. That Eugene McGee and Craig McGee had entered into an agreement to try and prevent Eugene McGee from being apprehended. And as a consequence of that, the police were not able to conduct a thorough investigation and therefore justice could not be done. Four and a half years later, it takes to get to trial. Every time that the defence tried to have the charges dismissed or Eugene McGee would plead not guilty, it was essentially like Ian being killed all over again. It was essentially him saying, I did nothing wrong, it's okay, I shouldn't be persecuted like this. It was really hard for me. I loved my dad so much. It was like ripping a piece of my heart out. It's really sad when, and I know what happens, that a lot of people don't like their dads, but I'm just like, well, at least you've got one. At least they're there for you. You're lucky. <laughs> Papers were filed today in the High Court in Adelaide. It is, in my view, quite an extraordinary thing that an individual who stands trial and is acquitted before a jury of his peers, further different charges were then laid with respect to the same events on Kapunda Road that night. That, in my view, was extraordinary and, and lamentable. But District Court Judge Peter Herriman has found them not guilty, ruling prosecutors didn't prove a conspiracy. Both Mr McGee and his brother were found not guilty of all charges. The judge accepted the brothers avoided police after the fatal crash, but he found there may have been other reasons for their behaviour. Here we were, two trials and a Royal Commission later, and nothing had changed. Everything was still the same. It was still the system saying, you did nothing wrong, it's OK. As far as criminal proceedings go, that was the end of the road and there was nowhere else to go. Hey, hey, Mama. The only hurdle I was yet still jumping was that with the Legal Practitioners Conduct Board. Yeah, how's yours, honey? Di Gilchrist Humphrey has complained to the Legal Practitioners Conduct Board that Mr McGee's decision to leave the scene of the fatal accident amounted to unprofessional conduct. For a whole range of reasons, including public confidence in the legal profession, I don't think Mr McGee should be practising. He should at the very least be suspended for a significant period of time. I was advised some months later that the board saw no reason why Eugene McGee should not be allowed to continue to practice. It accepted the evidence of psychiatrist Sandy McFarlane that as a result of previous trauma... There was a reasonable possibility that McGee was incapable of stopping immediately after the fatal collision. The fact that Eugene McGee uh, hadn't stopped after the accident in no way impacts upon his capacity uh, to undertake his, his work as a lawyer. From my uh, opinion, uh, I think the public of South Australia is angry about the Eugene McGee case because they think uh, it's an example of the lawyers acting as a club and protecting one of their own. I think they've got a pretty strong case. He's a bloody coward. And there seems to be one law for a lawyer who's got mates in the cops and one law for the common people, and that definitely needs to be rectified. I felt after the first trial and after the Royal Commission, and even still now to this day, that Eugene McGee has got away scot-free, so to speak. Yeah, they do do that. So how much are these little herbs? Because I could just buy these, couldn't I? In this case, highlights how badly the legal system can let people down. This family's been let down. The family of Ian Humphrey have been let down fundamentally by the legal system at every turn. Whatever the result of a, a properly run jury trial, you live with it. But 
this just miscarried from the beginning. In this particular case, uh, I don't think justice has truly been done. The injustice is that the matter was not allowed to rest in April, May 2005, and the people involved were not permitted to put it behind them and move forward. What people don't realise is that Mr McGee himself had been the victim of a hit and run accident. He was riding his bicycle to university when he was hit by an elderly woman. He sustained a significant back injury but chose not to prosecute her. I believe that that accident was a significant factor in impacting and influencing how he responded to the collision with Mr Humphrey. It's been an unmitigated disaster for everybody, certainly for my family, clearly for Mr Humphrey's family and all uh, people associated with Mr Humphrey's. Um, it, it's a tragedy for everybody involved uh, and, and the effects are ongoing for everybody involved. I have some sympathy for Eugene McGee. Uh, what he's been subjected to over the last eight years, my guess is that Eugene McGee, given his time again, would probably prefer to have stopped and been prosecuted in the normal way with perhaps a different outcome at that level. Uh, can I take this opportunity to uh, extend my sympathies to the family uh, for their loss, my uh, sorrow for what occurred, and to apologise to them for my reaction to the accident? <laughs> I feel an utter sense of failure because everybody at every level has said that Eugene McGee essentially didn't do anything wrong. What if he was a long-haired dog? Oh, I just wouldn't cope. The reality is I don't like where we are after these eight years, but I don't think I would have liked myself very much if I wouldn't have tried. The reality is that I can say to my kids that I tried. You know what the sad thing is, Lucy? No, She's going to be driving your car. Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh. I have been able to find a new partner. Yeah, I love He's been happy enough to take all of this and me and the kids on. Well, we didn't really yeah. so. He's not going to be part of the program because this is Ian's story. It's not our story. It's not his story. It's Ian's story.